I have to show that one is related to true in V of alpha. What is V of alpha? R. V of alpha is R. I have to show that one is related to true in R. Therefore, what is R? <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right, so if we picked R to be that, and we can do this with guesswork, right? Like so, so, so far, examining the first statement we have to prove, it looks like R should be that relation, but let's make sure that that R is going to work for the second bit that we have to prove, right? We still have to prove that the second thing in that, uh, the second components of those pairs are related, right? Sorry, let me find a good placement for this. <laughs> Here we go, all right. So now we need to show that the function lambda x, x equals 0 is, is related to the function lambda x, not x. How do we show the two functions are related? Well, the function definition says, give me two things that are related of the argument type. So I have to start by saying, suppose that I have two things, v1 and v2, any arguments that are related at the argument type alpha, v alpha, my environment contains alpha maps to int, bool, and our r. So I'm saying suppose v1, v2 are related at v of alpha. In other words, I'm saying suppose v1, v2 are in r. Therefore, v1 is one, one and v2 is true. true. OK, so I know this now. And under knowing this, I have to show that the bodies of the lambda, in other words, x equals 0, is related to not x <coughs> at the type bool. Oh, yes, I have to substitute, sorry. The x here is v1, and the x here is v2. We know that v1 is 1, and we know that v2 is true. Therefore, both of those are false. And false is related to false in both, right? So our choice of R forced us. And how did it help us? It basically helped us at this point. At this point, we were forced to say, suppose that I have two arbitrary inputs for my function, completely arbitrary. But they have to be related at the type alpha. So anytime a fun you know, the function definition kind of says, all right, you have to show two functions are related, you get to you know, you, you have to start by assuming that you have two arbitrary inputs that are related and then show that your outputs are related. Here, what helps us is that, yeah, sure, there are two arbitrary inputs that are related, but they, know, they come from the relation R that we got to pick, so we got to sort of cut down our space to just the one and the true, and then the rest of the proof goes through, right? So again, it's just the power of parametricity. So this, um, so we, we use the word parametricity when we're talking about universal types, and we use the word representation independence when we talk about existential types. But it's just a dual concept. It's, it's just a constant representation independence is a consequence of parametricity. And the phrase means that the representation of the witness type of all of the alphas is something that clients of this existential type will never be able to see. Right? And that's sort of the essence of modularity um, in the software that we build using statically typed, good statically typed languages. Right? OK. Um, all right, um, so that's existential types. I think I'm going to do a lot less than I thought. So let me maybe pull. Um, here's what, uh, what is on my list. And maybe I'm going to just get a show of hands to, to assess what I should cover and what I should cut. All right, I want to talk about recursive types. There's something really interesting to show you in terms of how you edit this in order to handle a non-terminating language. In particular, right here, where we say two expressions are related, right now we say that they both run to values and the values are related. You can't do that when you have non-termination. And that's, there's a little subtle thing here with step indexing that I want to show you. That's one thing. Um, then I wanted to briefly talk about how you prove logical relations are sound and complete. But um, all of that is, is in uh, OPLSS lectures from past years, so you can just go and look at it. And the third thing that I wanted to talk about is um, I have a bunch of slides which essentially kind of say a little bit about um, the history of logical relations, mainly touch upon step index logical relations and you know, what work has been done over the last uh, decade or so. They just give you sort of initial pointers to what's out there. Um, and they're sort of from my perspective, obviously. Um, so it's not utterly comprehensive, but it's, uh, there's quite a bit in there. So, but that, there's an emphasis there on application. All right, which ones do you want? <laughs> um, <laughs> 
Sorry, what is that? Is the first one on lectures of previous years. Uh, is what in the lectures of previous years? Sorry, sorry, the, first the third one, yes. Um, I have covered uh, those slides in previous years. I can tell you exactly which previous years. I've added some new stuff now because those were previous years. But <laughs> <laughs> new stuff, okay. Um, but they're mostly, they're, it's just sort of a survey. It's applications, all right? Okay, all right. Okay, um, let's do that. So I will tell you how to find the old stuff. Let's start with that, actually. All right, so. Okay. Um, if you go look at the, I think OPLSS 12, so my lectures, OPLSS 12. In fact, one of my undergraduates has taken those lectures and I even put them on YouTube. So you can find them on YouTube if you don't want to stream them from the OPLSS website. Um, but uh, that year I covered, so I, I covered in detail how you do a binary logical relation for recursive types. So how you do LR for recursive types. You know, and this is a binary one for program equivalence. Um, and of course, it's step indexed. Um, probably the second last lecture that year also covered mutable references. So I did a type safety proof for mutable references. And um, mutable references are really hard. In particular, when I say mutable references, I'm talking about ML style mutable references um, in the sense that you, you can take um, functions and closures and store them into your memory. Once you can do that, you can create cycles in memory. Once you can create those cycles in memory, um, the semantic model that you try to build for that becomes utterly circular, and it needs to be stratified. And the step indexing helps you stratify it. Okay, so all of those, de those details are, are in that lecture. Um, so that was the topic of my PhD thesis. Um, that's also in the slides uh, as a reference. Okay, um, so this is OPLSS lectures. Maybe I should also put down papers. So a lot of the binary logical relations for recursive types, the proofs are spelled out in excruciating detail, <laughs> if you like, um, in the technical report that goes with my ESOP 06 paper. So that was the first paper to show that um, you can actually do sound and complete logical relations for recursive types, sound and complete with respect to contextual equivalence. Um, there was a tiny subtlety why you know that that wasn't quite established in the original paper on step index logical relations, which is due to Appel and McAllister. And again, you don't have to write down the names of the papers because they're in the slide deck and you can look it up. Okay, um, what else? So, soundness and completeness is also covered in these lectures. Like the technicalities of how you prove that logical relations are sound and complete with respect to contextual equivalence. And that's a really important thing. I, I kind of keep coming back to it because, you know, that's why we build these logical relations. We want a proof method to show that two programs are equivalent, right? And so knowing the details of how, you, once you've set up this logical relation, how do you establish that it is exactly the same thing as what is defined by the def you know, contextual equivalence? That's, that's critical. That's important to know and do. Um, okay, so, so the OPLSS 12 lectures cover all of that, and I believe the last lecture that year does cover sort of the survey. And um, for all I know, I may have said more than I'll manage to say today. I can't remember. Okay. Um, all right. I think that's it. Was there any other particular point that... No? All right. Yes. So you showed me this program of Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. It's precisely small, small operations. So we don't have any notion of saying that they are stacks. We just say that they are children of the contextual interface. Um, yes, but I claim that that's all we need. And you know why that's all we need? It goes back to the definition of contextual equivalence. You know, when we set up the definition of contextual equivalence, we, we wrote down a typed notion of contextual equivalence. So we said, Is this darker okay, or should I use a darker one? Okay, all right. Um, we said that E1 is contextually equivalent to E2 at some type tau if 
for all possible well-typed contexts, for all C that take something of type tau, the type checks under delta gamma, right, so that we can plug in these E1 and E2, which type check are under delta gamma, have type tau under delta gamma. So we want a context that has a whole of this type and produces results of, that are closed programs of type bool. And then we say that it is in those, you know, in all such well-typed contexts, it better be the case that C with E1 produces the same value as C with E2. So Christopher, coming to your point, you're, you're asking, um, they may, you said something like they may not be equivalent at The SAC specification might be wrong? No, right, so, so go back to, we have, we have an alpha, that's the SAC. Mm -hmm. We have an alpha uh, uh, plot range to alpha, and we have an input. Yes. And the power to alpha is the input of alpha. Yep. Right, the big alpha is the uh, boolean, and that's the make E2, right? Okay. And then plot always with, um, return zero and the same boolean, mm -hmm. and the push always just returns the same boolean, it's not the argument. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so you have two packages, they're doing something that's not very stack-like at all, exactly. but they are equivalent, right. agreed. So in other words, you're trying to point out that what we are talking about, right, we're just, you're absolutely right. We are simply <coughs> talking about when I write down two different packs that implement an existential type, I can use this proof method to show that they are equivalent. And we might be able to do that, but that does not, that is not verification of code. That does not tell us that these two are valid stack implementations. Right? You need to write a much richer specification for a stack implementation and then go take, you know, take a pack implementation and verify it against a rich specification in order to know that it is in fact a stack. Yes? Yes, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. Yeah. Exactly. So if I have false here, then these two packages are not equivalent. Mm -hmm. We will not be able to prove it. Yep. That is, a, uh, that is uh, exactly the, r the right idea. In fact, uh, so in the slides, um, I, I briefly talk about um, how we can set up logical relations for uh, concurrency. And then what you can do is you can um, think of the logical relation as instead of E1 equivalent to E2, think of it as an implementation refines a specification. So if you have a concurrent language, you can write down a sequential specification for some concurrent data structure and then show that your you know, very fine-grained concurrent data structure actually implements that specification, refines that specification. And the idea of why I'm writing less than, right? We, we don't want equivalence. In sequential, what we want is that every single behavior of the implementation, and the implementation is concurrent, so it might have many different behaviors, but every single behavior of the implementation should be a possible behavior of the specification. And the specification can be purely naive, simple, sequential code, right? For the same data structure. All right. Um, so this is uh, this is what we did in our Popple 13 paper, and then there's um, follow-up work as well. Uh, okay. So. I have uh, lectures in 2013. I think I'm mostly covered, oh yes, 2013 has one very new lecture. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so my recent research over the last two, three years um, has mostly been about compiler correctness. So you know, on day one I said to you, you can use logical relations to prove uh, compiler correctness. In particular, the idea there might be, you can do this in a, in a bunch of different ways. Um, but one um, simple idea that's been around for ages is that you can set up a cross-language logical relation. So let's say you have a source expression that compiles to some target expression, all right? You can set up a logical relation that relates different languages on the two sides. So far we've been setting logical relations to do equivalence of, of two programs in the same language. But 
you can set up a logical relation, I call these cross-language logical relations, to relate source programs to target programs. Um, and then you can use that logical relation as your definition of what equivalence between source and target should mean. Right? Compiler correctness says when you run the source thing, you should get the same behavior as when you run the target thing. So you can essentially capture that statement by specifying a logical relation. Um, so my, back to my lecture in, um, in uh, 2013, um, I think it's probably the second last lecture or maybe it's the last one, it's a very long one, I went over time. I, I, I compared two approaches to doing correct compilation of components. Um, and I say components, let's back up a bit. I'm sort of covering what's in my slides, uh, but never mind. Um, okay, so if we talk about ComCert for a second. Um, ComCert for the longest time, do people know what ComCert is? Yes, okay, ComCert is a verified uh, compiler for C uh, that Xavier Leroy and various of, uh, colleagues of his have been working on since uh, um, about 10 years now. Um, and it's really um, an amazing um, project. Uh, the ComCert compiler has actually been subjected to significant random testing and it has come out to be you know, uh, more robust than GCC and LLVM, which have been in production for decades. Um, right? Well, LLVM, not quite decades. Uh, but um, there is a paper at PLDI 11 or 12 by um, John Regeer's group at Utah, which says, so far, ComCert is the only compiler, the only you know, sort of um, C compiler, that we have found to not contain any wrong code errors or any miscompilation errors, at least in the verified part of ComCert. At the time, not all of ComCert was verified. I think there was a bug in the parser or something, and there may have been a bug at the very, very bottom. Like, the bulk of it was um, verified at that time. And since then, you know, that verification has grown, so it's more robust now. Um, okay, so, um, ComCert proves compiler correctness for whole programs. It says that if you compile a whole program, then you, uh, then I can, you know, my theorem guarantees that when you run the source program, you get the same thing as when you run the target program, okay? But in true, in reality, we almost never compile whole programs, do we? Even when you think you're compiling a whole program, you're actually compiling something that will be compiled down and linked with something at the target level. You're gonna link with the runtime library at the very least. <laughs> You're probably also going to link with various um, other libraries, C, co uh, C libraries and so on. And we write multi-language software these days, right? So you might want to link with code that actually comes from very different languages from C. So my point is that you know, the, the traditional theorem that um, ComCert has proved um, does not handle, or did not handle, there's a caveat, there's recent work, um, basically said that if you compile a whole, sorry, let me change this. If you compile a whole program P to a whole, pro whole source program to a whole target program, excuse me, uh, then when you run the source program, you're going to get the same observable trace of events as when you run that compiled target program PT. And basically the way that the proof works is you line things up. You say that there's a simulation between these two um, behaviors, right? Um, if PS and PT are related, then, and I take one step here, then I'm going to, uh, then I can take one or more steps at the target level and things will line up again. That's essentially how the proof goes. But if you think about it for a second, and I'm keeping this very high level, but you know, you can't, if, if the source and target program were components, how do you run a component? You can't run a component, right? You have to talk about the context in which that component will eventually live. You have to talk about what you're going to link it with. And that notion, you know, um, that is called compositional compiler correctness. You want to be able to write down a theorem that says the compilation of a component is correct, not just the compilation of, a, of an entire program. And this is a really active field of research right now. Um, okay, so that's where logical relations come in. You can, you can actually do this component if you use this cross-language logical relation technique, right? You say that I have a component ES and a, that compiles to a component ET, and logical relations give you this nice structure that you can talk about components and, and stick them into the rest of the context, so to speak. You've already seen this, right? I talk about, um, there. When I talk about the open logical relation, imagine that this is source and this is target. These guys specify what my inputs are. So think about this at the low level and the high level, right? High level source program has some inputs that it's waiting for. The compiled target program is waiting to be linked with certain things. 
at exactly those same spots, so to speak. All right? And when we say that you get to give me all possible you know, related substitutions, what we're really saying is that if you give me code to link with that, you know, at, um, If you give me something, um, ah, I need to do this more. Okay, so if you compile ES to some ET, and then you want to link with some ET prime, that's the thing that you want to link with. As long as you can show me that there is some ES prime that is logically related to that ET prime, this is what happens when I say give me related substitutions, right? Then I know that when I put this whole program together, I'm going to get the same behavior as when I put that whole program together that those two will be related. That's kind of the idea, okay? That's, that's why I keep saying um, that these cross-language logical relations give you correct compilation of components. All right, so that lecture basically goes into, it does an instance of, uh, you know, a really naive compiler transformation, uh, but it shows you a cross-language logical relation for proving it correct. And then I show you the drawback of the cross-language logical relations approach. Basically, the drawback is that if you look at what I just said, you know, I said, all right, I compiled my component ES to my component ET, and now you're going to give me some ET prime to link with. But before I can say anything about whether it's okay to link with that ET prime, I'm, I'm demanding that you also give me some ES prime that is equivalent to it, equivalent using my logical relation. That's a really strong requirement. What that says is that I, the, the, that compiler correctness theorem is only allowing you to link with code that is related to something in your own source language. You can't link with code that might come from uh, maybe other more expressive source languages. Okay? Or at least you don't.